Hi, my name is Brianna Bigley. I've spent most of my career working in the vines and wineries of St. Helena, California, and am currently the assistant winemaker at Patson Hall. In addition to my work in the wine industry, I teach climate change and business courses at UC Berkeley's Haas School of Business. In this video, we'll cover the actions that growers and wineries can take to reduce their climate impact. The first step is to understand the sources of our emissions. We can't know where we're going if we don't know where we stand. Here are two graphics outlining emissions for the wine industry. The one on the left is from the International Wineries for Climate Action, the IWCA. This chart represents self-reported emissions from IWCA's membership and was published in 2023. These emissions cover wineries from across the globe. On the right, we have a life cycle assessment that was commissioned by the California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance, the CSWA, in 2011. Emissions in this graph are representative of the California wine industry as a whole. The two graphs are not exactly comparable since they represent timeframes a decade apart and break emissions into different categories. What I want to highlight are what they have in common. Let's specifically look at vineyard soil emissions. This subcategory is represented by the greenhouse gas nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is produced when bacteria in the soil consume nitrate through the process of denitrification. Nitrous oxide is an incredibly potent greenhouse gas and molecule for molecule warms the planet about 300 times more than CO2. No matter the origin of the nitrate, this process will happen. If you apply a nitrogen fertilizer, organic or conventional, some of that will be converted into nitrous oxide. If you till in plow down mix, some nitrogen from the legumes will convert to nitrous oxide. So why is it that the IWCA and CSWA's numbers for soil emissions are different? Well, on one hand, farm practices alter these numbers. The more saturated soils are, the more likely the production of nitrous oxide. Numerous short fertilizer applications will lead to fewer nitrous oxide emissions. Growers who stick to the recommendations of their blade and petiole analysis without throwing in a little extra for good measure will also see lower emissions. The microbes in the soil, not just the vines, are utilizing the nitrogen we apply. If you apply more than the vines can take up, there's more that goes to feeding the bacteria in the soil and is lost in emissions. Why else are the numbers so different? 4% from the IWCA and 17 from CSWA. That lies in the operations. From the IWCA graph, we can see that vineyard soil emissions are actually accounted for in two different parts of the graph. Some of the soil-based emissions for IWCA members is from the purchase of grapes. What I want this to highlight is that each individual operation has its own footprint. There are general sources of emissions that we all share, soil emissions, employee commute emissions, emissions from packing, but the quantity of these emissions per category depend on each individual winery and vineyard's own operations. This understanding is important because it means that certain emissions reduction measures are very meaningful for one company while not for another. For example, companies that provide on-site housing won't see emissions reductions from things like carpooling incentives. This same measure could be very impactful for a company with ranches spanning multiple counties. Depending on the sources of our emissions, different strategies are needed. Understanding where your specific emissions come from is essential to implementing meaningful, impactful measures. Now, let's walk through some ways that growers and wineries can reduce their emissions. In Napa County, California, we're lucky that our default energy mix, MCE Light Green, is roughly 60% renewable. Still, we can do better than that 
by switching to 100% renewable. One such option is to switch to PG&E Solar Choice. Another is to opt up from MCE Light Green to Deep Green, which is 100% renewable. With MCE Deep Green, PG&E continues to deliver and bill for electricity. The expected cost increase is a small 1 to 3%. In this graphic from MCE, we see an expected 2.4% increase for their average residential customer. On-site solar is another great way to reduce your climate impact. Solar arrays like this are going to become much more commonplace as the years go by. And the reason for that is simple. Energy, you see, is free, it comes from the sun. You don't have to pay for the energy coming in from the sun. You do have to pay for the solar panels and the inverters and the cabling and all that sort of thing. But the energy itself is free. This large array, as you might guess, is also powering a large facility, specifically a winery in Napa County, California. And wineries have huge electricity demands for chillers and all kinds of equipment over the course of a full year of operation. But the real advantage of solar panels like this is that you now know your cost to the local electric utility will be dramatically reduced. There's also a little bit of operational maintenance that's required. You have to wash the panels a few times a year to get off dust and pollen and things like that. But if you live in a part of the country that gets rain on a regular basis, that'll do most of that job for you. And then the panels just sit there and produce electricity more or less indefinitely. In all likelihood, a large array like this that would have been expensive, some millions of dollars, will probably be used for more than 30 years because the operational costs are close to zero, the capital costs get paid off, break even relative to purchasing electricity, might be as short as five years, might be more like seven or eight years, depending on tax incentives, but after that, produces electricity indefinitely for free. Plus, if battery storage is also installed, it can add the benefit of grid resiliency. Another way to reduce your climate impact is to electrify everything. Company vehicles, forklifts, tractors. Farming equipment that's charged using electricity, not diesel fuel or gasoline. They could say that that's the shape of things to come, except it's already here. So here it is in 2023, and farming equipment has gone electric. Now, this takes time. These electric tractors cost money. They're new and unfamiliar in some ways, but also very familiar in some ways. An electric tractor has a lot of the same advantages as an electric car. Compared with, in this case, a diesel power tractor, it doesn't have most of the parts that you'd find in a traditional conventional diesel powered uh, tractor or any other piece of farming equipment. There's no radiator, there's no water pump, there's no fuel tank, there's no fuel pump, and on and on and on. What there is, is an electric motor powered by a lithium ion battery, just like an electric vehicle. Operations like you see behind me are a perfect use of electric vehicles. These forklifts that are moving pallets of empty bottles and filled bottles going into and out of a bottling line at a winery are absolutely perfect use of electricity to power forklifts. Why is that? Forklifts don't go very far. They stay inside a warehouse or just outside a warehouse moving goods that are too heavy to move by hand. Meaning, unlike an electric car that might go 300 miles in a day or an electric tractor that might go five miles in a day, a forklift doesn't go very far at all, maybe a quarter of a mile of distance per day. And the result of that is that it's never very far from a charging station. So expect to see not just electric cars on the roads and electric tractors in the field, but things like electric forklifts and other factory and warehouse equipment 
more and more in the coming years. Another way to reduce your climate impact is to keep your property green without quotations. The more plant life on your land, the more carbon that's being pulled out of the atmosphere via photosynthesis. A meta-analysis of 50 studies highlights this fact. The analysis concludes that no-till vineyards with cover crops had more carbon stored as soil organic carbon. There are also a handful of other ways that our industry can reduce its climate impact. We can avoid using single-use plastics, biofuels, and bioplastics. We can compost so that our green waste and food waste converts to CO2 rather than the more potent methane. Decreasing air travel and reducing the weight of glass bottles each individually have huge climate benefits. Allowing work from home, financially incentivizing carpooling, and shifting to a 410 schedule all reduce emissions from commuting. There are numerous actions we can each take. What matters is that we act, and that we act with the science as a guide. This is the only way that we can guarantee that our efforts actually achieve something. Considering the world surpassed 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming in 2023, that is what we need. Meaningful, impactful action. Now, I leave it in your hands to figure out what that means for your operation.